Good morning, folks. Testing one, two, three. Jim Chiquetta here. Let's just dive right in. What are our goals here? You know, um, every day, it's selecting the right technology for the uh, application at hand. We're going to talk about cellular bonding, different Wi-Fi uh, networks, 2.4 and 5 gigahertz, uh, 60 gig unlicensed and 70 gig licensed. So how long have we been doing wireless? My, my uh, compatriot, my countryman, Guglielmo, Gugli, I'm half Italian, I can't pronounce his name, Guglielmo Marconi uh, uh, is the father of uh, wireless communications. So uh, if it wasn't for Marconi, we wouldn't be sending anything wireless today. Uh, um, uh, but what, what, what is the particular challenge we struggle with as engineers in the, in the broadcast and video communication space is that video always pushes the envelope. Uh, uh, you know, we have high definition, now we're going to 4K, then 8K, and it's always video that is on the bleeding edge, you know. Uh, um, um, you know, uh, when it came to communications, you know, video pushed the boundaries of coax, of microwave, of satellite, of fiber optics, of cellular. Uh, you know, five, ten years ago, who would have dreamed of streaming video over cellular networks? You'd say, that's impossible. So uh, video has always required higher bandwidth, higher quality of service. Uh, it's sensitive to delay. You know, video or television is usually live or, or near live or their live elements to, to television broadcast. So these are all, all concerns we have to struggle with. And so, so again, you know, how do we select the correct technology for the application? A lot of vendors, you know, I've probably been guilty of this in my career, is like, well, I have this widget, this, this square peg, and I want to fit it into the client's round hole, and I'm going to jam it in there and, and, and say, okay, that's the right solution to your problem. We, at Vitovation, we strive to, to find the correct technology. And then hopefully, you know, it's a technology that we have. Uh, if we can't solve the client's problem, we'll, we'll tell them, we, sorry, we can't help you this time. We'll try to make a referral to someone that can, uh, an ally or, or a, 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 another entity out there that can solve that problem. But our goal is to, is to, 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 to answer those struggles, those frustrations you're having with, you know, balancing performance, reliability, and price. You know, a lot of times customers will come to us and say, you know, I want the utmost reliability and re performance. I want five nines, but I only have a $5,000 budget. So we'll, we'll help the client weigh the different trade-offs, how to build uh, uh, a system that meets most of their needs and within their budget. So what are some of the... Uh, uh, um, uh, the, the, it's all about bandwidth. It's all about bit rate. And some of the, some of the criteria of how much bandwidth, how much resolution, uh, uh, how much latency uh, we can, a system will, will give us, it really depends on multiple factors. And it depends on the antennas, the amount of gain, the size, the technology, the type of antennas. It also is highly dependent on the interference in that given uh, uh, space or application. Um, um, you know, crowded ballpark has way more interference than an open open field in the middle of nowhere. Uh, depends how far you want to go and the bandwidth of the actual signal you want to send through. You know, if you want to send uh, 1080 80p 60, it's a different animal than sending uh, SD video or standard definition video. Uh, then there's different modulation schemes. So uh, a modulation scheme is how we fit the bits in the given bandwidth, and we'll get into that. So so there's advanced modulation schemes that help us economize or cram more bits into a given pipe or a given bandwidth. So we'll discuss some of those, those topics. This part of me, it seems, seems my PowerPoint needs two clicks to advance. Uh, so here's, here's about those modulation schemes. So, so one common modulation scheme in, in wireless uh, particularly is a quadrature phase shift keying. I'm, I'm not the, the, getting into what that means and the science behind that is a little bit out of the scope of, of this paper. Uh, maybe on, on deeper dives we can go into you know, what that means and the science behind that. But basically it's a modulation scheme that gives us two bits per, sim, per symbol 
or a way of thinking of it is it's a two-bit wide bus going through the air. So because we're, we're talking about wireless, it's, we're going through the air. Uh, 16 QAM uh, quadrature amplitude modulation doubles that because we can put four bits per symbol, or we have a four-bit bus going through the channel. And this is all with the same uh, channel bandwidth. So, so uh, oh, let me see here. Wait, I meant to turn on my, my pointer. Pardon me. So you see here, it's the same bandwidth. So it's, it's a two-bit bus with QPSK and a four-bit bus with 16 uh, QAM. Um, but there's a trade-off. The equipment is more expensive because we need more processing power to do this heavier encoding, both on the transmit side and the receive side. It also might make the device a little bigger, uh, draw, draw more power because you have to have more uh, elaborate, uh, heavier-duty processing uh, uh, to, to achieve these uh, uh, higher bit per symbol rates. But we also, there's a trade-off in sensitivity to noise and interference. Cramming more bits, the bits are closer together, there's noise, it's hard to, harder to differentiate or discriminate between the different bits or packets of information, and noise and interference becomes more significant. So, so again, we, we can help you with these trade-offs. A lot of modern systems are adaptive. Uh, modern Wi-Fi will actually jump between encoding schemes depending upon the noise environment. So, so systems will change their encoding scheme depending upon the RF environment. Then we have even more complex schemes, uh, orthogonal uh, frequency division multiplexing and its cousin, coded orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. Again, um, I could uh, present a 100-page paper on, on uh, a COFDM. Uh, might put a few people to sleep. But uh, the, basically, the, the premise is, is that instead of having uh, one carrier with a high bit rate or high uh, bandwidth payload, what you do is within the given channel uh, that the FCC allows, we'll put multiple carriers uh, at slightly different frequencies or even the same frequency carrying lower bit payloads. So you get diversity in that, you know, all your eggs are not in one stream. You have multiple streams going through. Uh, these systems are more adaptive to the uh, changing environment. So it's, it's hundreds, or in the case of uh, LTE, the cellular protocol, it's thousands of RF carriers uh, handling lower speed data simultaneously. And then the, the, so the receiver uh, puts all those packets back together, grabs all those streams. And, and the cool thing about uh, 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 COFDM and this type of technology, it actually thrives in a multipath environment. The, uh, it's usually combined with uh, a MIMO, uh, a multiple in, multiple out types antennas. I don't want to jump ahead, but I'll get to that. But, but it actually thrives in a, in a multipath environment. So if you are in a, um, I'll say a basketball venue or a hockey venue, and there's a tin ceiling, you get bounce off the ceiling. And you can go longer distance by bouncing off of metal objects. The downside to that is all that bounce and all that scattering will interfere with other systems. So there's always a silver lining or, or a dark cloud to your silver lining. You think, well, I get gain all this distance, but then nobody else can transmit because I'm bouncing everywhere. So, so the, again, there's always trade-offs. So, uh, so you get better performance also with vehicles that are moving with COFDM. Because they're lower bit rate streams, uh, they're less susceptible to like Doppler shifts. And you know, if you're if you're streaming video from a moving car or uh, a slower moving aircraft, uh, 100 150 miles per hour, COFDM works works really well. We have other techniques that we use for you know like NASCAR and cars that are going you know 200 250 miles per hour. So again, these are part of the pain points that we help our clients solve. Uh, 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 you know, is it a, a stationary platform? Is it moving platform? Um, uh, COFDM, they, uh, multiple units can be synchronized. So the example where I said the video signals are scattering all over the tin roof or in this in this uh, steel enclosed venue, uh, if if it's if they're synchronized and they operate off of a common base station, uh, multiple camera systems can thrive in this. Multi-path, uh, multi uh, rich environment. Uh, 
So, so again, as I mentioned, you know, these more complex, the more complex the modulation scheme is, you'll need a heavier processing, bigger FPGAs, bigger DSP, digital signal processing chips. You're probably going to draw more power. Uh, it's used predominantly in, in 4G LTE. That's a, that's a very widespread application for uh, CUFDM. And, of course, we're using it in the, in the wireless video uh, uh, applications. So distance limitations, you know, so what are the factors? You know, what frequency or what carrier we're going to choose? Uh, the types of antennas we're going to use, whether there's interference, obstructions, that's a big thing for us. Uh, are there obstructions? You know, is it a physical building between point A and point B? Is it a foliage on a tree that's so it's a partial obstruction? Uh, when dealing with hockey in the NHL, we had a lot of steel uh, infrastructure blocking, steel girders blocking some of the signals coming up from the hockey goal or reflections uh, off of adjacent steel. So obstruction depends on the environment. Uh, 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 are there other radios or fans with cell phones with Wi-Fi operating close proximity? And we'll help you make decisions on what technology to use based on, on, on some of these factors. So, you know, basic rules of thumb, lower frequencies typically go, go longer distances. Um, uh, lower frequencies will go through walls better, will go through uh, semi-porous, you know, so, so through, um, won't go through concrete very well, but, you know, most residents are made out of wood and sheetrock, so that's why your cell phone most of the time sort of works when you're indoors. Uh, but if you're at work in more of a steel and, and concrete building, you'll find your cell phone doesn't work as well. So, so uh, that's why the cellular bands are, tend to be on, on lower frequencies. So they're less sensitive to obstructions. But the lower frequencies are more heavily regulated by the FCC. Um, most of these lower frequency bands, you know, the cell phone providers have grabbed up a lot of them. Uh, they're, they're licensed by, by the FCC to the, to the carriers. And because they're heavily regulated, these bands tend to be pretty narrow. They're, they're narrow bands. So again, narrow bands don't usually lend themselves nicely for, for video transport. So uh, then again, the distance is compromised if we use the higher or the, or the more sophisticated, you know, if we jump from 2 bits to 4 bits, QPSK to 16 QAM, uh, we're not going to be able to go as far. You know, uh, distance usually equates to higher noise, less signal strength. Signal to noise, you know, then the signal goes down, uh, brings the noise floor up, and then we can't communicate cleanly. So it's usually uh, a shorter uh, a transmission distance. Uh, then the types of antennas. Uh, I'll go into more detail about the antennas, but, you know, basically uh, a narrower beam antenna will go further. We're, we're concentrating the RF energy uh, uh, at a fixed point instead of spreading it over a wide area. So you, you can see here an omnidirectional it's spreading energy 365 degrees. Uh, any one given point on that 365 degrees, it's, it's sharing the energy. It's, it's a fixed amount of energy coming out of that antenna. If it's, if it's not directional, it's going everywhere. You have a wider coverage, but not as long of a distance. You can cover in a circle. Uh, then there's panel antennas that have a little bit more focus, uh, higher gain, and will cover a zone, a quadrant, you know. Uh, and then... Uh, Horn antennas and parabolic antennas give you the narrow beam. I'm going to get into antennas a little bit more. This is just kind of a, uh, a getting started. So, so here, as I said, the omni is 365 degrees, low gain, shorter distance, uh, parabolic, higher gain, and longer distances. Uh, so you know, then, then it's the environment. So when we were approached by the National Hockey League going on four years now, uh, they didn't want a 5 gig system or 2.4 2. 2. gig was out of the question. Uh, 5 gig, they had issues with communication systems, VoIP systems, telemetry systems at a lot of these uh, NBA and NFL, uh, NHL, I'm sorry, NHL uh, arenas. Uh, uh, There's too much interference and uh, it would require um, detailed frequency coordination by the league at every game. Uh, since the league decided to use 60 gigahertz for their own internal uh, in-net goal officiating, yes, the broadcasters might frequency coordinate amongst themselves, but the league doesn't necessarily have to get involved. The league's equipment is not using that band. So, 
So uh, the NHL, uh, uh, CTO, and VP of Technology decided 60 gig uh, was the way to go. Uh, it's worked flawlessly. There's no interference. Everyone's happy. Uh, the other operators can use their 5 gig bands, their 7 gig bands for video communications, and we don't interfere with each other. So even a, a hostile environment like this mess you see right here, uh, we can design a system that, that will work in that environment. Even if you want to use one of the crowded bands, such as 5 gig, if you use a more directional antenna, uh, you, you prevent stepping on other people that are operating in more of an omni approach, and you don't interfere with them, and they don't interfere with you because you're going kind of point to point with directionality in your antenna. So, so the right antennas can, can overcome a lot of interference issues. So, so this is why we, you know, in our business, we warn you guys when you engage with us, we're going to ask you a lot of questions. Um, um, I'm sure you'll have a lot of questions for us, but this is why we ask those questions. We don't want to overlook something, install a system, and then realize there's some other critical piece of gear operating on that same frequency. That would be a disaster. So uh, here to, to talk more about obstruction. So w we ran into this, uh, uh, some of the, one thing I discovered is when dealing with some of these hockey and NBA venues, uh, uh, Chicago, uh, Detroit, um, there's more steel in the ceiling because the venues have to hack, are designed to carry a heavy snow load. And the way they do that is the architects don't want a lot of steel hanging down into the bowl. You know, it's ugly. It's, 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 you, know, you want a more clean look to your venue. So if I, when I compare um, the United Airlines, uh, I think the, the, Chicago, uh, the Bulls and uh, Blackhawks, it's, it's United Airlines Center. When I compare that to Staples Center here in L.A., uh, there's a lot of steel at Staples Center here in Southern Cal, but there's not a lot of anticipated snow load on that roof. When you compare it to the, to the United Center in Chicago, a lot of steel coming down low uh, from the ceiling to hold that ceiling up and that snow load. So we had to work around a lot of beams. In some cases, beams are in our way. We had to put receivers in different locations. But even if you have clear line of sight, the, the RF signal has an envelope, or, or the, it's called the Fresnel zone. It, it's, the, it's the shape. It's the RF uh, pattern, a radiation pattern of, of uh, the given antenna. And when you buy a given antenna, uh, on the data sheet, it'll show you the RF envelope, and you know sometimes it has lobes, different things like that. There's the main lobe, side lobes, if it's a directional antenna, and you can get into trouble where one of these side lobes, it's it's relatively low power, it's not the sweet spot, and you can see in this picture, if it were to reflect off some of these buildings and bounce into this receiving antenna, you're going to get some multipath effects, even though it's technically not in the line of sight. So you need to have some margin around uh, your line of sight. Uh, uh, in the case of the NHL, you know, adjacent beams, pillars, and whatnot, if something was kind of in that RF cone or that Fresnel zone, uh, it could um, uh, interfere. And, you know, there's ways to cheat it, too. So like this antenna, if it was getting some bounce off these buildings, you might want to misalign it slightly, aim it a little high, so it misses that multipath, that multipath signal. Doesn't doesn't get in there. You you you, you kind of uh, increase the uh, or change the ap the uh, acceptance aperture of that signal or, or the 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 so so, you, so ba basically blind it or or, or 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 get rid of that unwanted signal. So there's different techniques during installation that we can that can help with that. And then surprisingly, you know, a lot of DoD applications they're they're still using analog video on, on some rare occasions, but they it's still out there. It, it's going away, but. A uh, big, bigger issue is, you know, are you consumer or professional? Do you want HDMI or HDSDI as your I.O.? And again, there's blurry lines between the two. Um, are you going to be needing to edit uh, the, the, the video stream quickly in post-production? So we might pick uh, an encoding scheme or a modulation scheme or more of an encoding scheme that would, would be uh, more uh, conducive to editing. Uh, um, you know, will the video be sent directly to a display, or is some is there some post production, some post processing, video s switching? Is it going into a production switcher? That kind of thing. Uh, all these things will help us choose the right technology for you. 
So, you know, again, here's an example. This happens to be a fiber optic widget that we provide, but, you know, here's your HDSDI or, or your fiber optic ports, your, your what we would call broadcast ports, you know, your serial digital interface, whether it's SD, standard def, or HD. Uh, it's uncompressed. It does have some color encoding, 422 color encoding. It's usually a BNC connector, 75 ohms. There's embedded audio, metadata, and time code. Again, you know, most uh, wireless camera rigs uh, don't need to send time code through. If time code is embedded in the stream, in most cases we can, we can move that. If that's important to you, we need to know that. You know, we, uh, uh, most systems will handle video and embedded audio as a minimum. If there's other ancillary data that you need to go through, we need to know about that. Uh, uh, our 60 gig systems, because they're uncompressed, will handle the whole HDSDI payload with embedded time code metadata. When you encode H.264 or something similar, you got to break the, the HDSDI or the HDMI stream apart, and the video and the audio are encoded separately. Uh, a lot of times the, the metadata time code might be discarded, so you would need a system that, that handles that, that payload. So, so, so that's important to let us know uh, the signals you need to get through. Here's an example of a Pro AV routing switcher with HDMI I/O. So again, more of a pro or consumer protocol, or I'm not protocol or or video interface, uh, low profile, 19 pins, multi-bit. Um, um, it actually has um, uh, full full color space when you compare it to HDSDI. So it's kind of a misnomer, you know, is HDSDI? Oh, that's that's broadcast, that's fully uncompressed, but it has some has 422 color space encoding. Not all the color information is going through, whereas HDMI, you can open that up and have a, have a wider color space, um, but a, a, a deeper depth of color space. But the thing to watch out for is uh, because it's used in the consumer world, it's copyright protected, the HDCP. So if you're, if you're playing a, a Blu-ray DVD from a Blu-ray player, and you're thinking to put it over wireless, uh, it may or may not work. Um, um, you know, copyrighted content gets, gets to be more complicated. Uh, uh, we have ways around that, you know, and you want to make sure you do it legally. Uh, the whole idea of copyright protection is for the studios to protect their content. They don't want their content being bootlegged or, or, or um, distributed illegally. Uh, another uh, uh, wireless, uh, another type of interface, you know, S-Video is, is, is very rare now. It's probably phased out completely or near completely. DVB ASI, uh, uh, most of our wireless systems don't support that. Uh, satellite uh, rigs will, will have an ASI uh, I.O. typically. Um, some of our encoders have uh, uh, an IP output as well as ASI. So this ASI output could be used to feed into a, uh, a satellite uh, um, uh, uh, link. Um, again, you know, an, a an ASI stream is just uh, one or several encoded streams encapsulated in a 270 meg uh, wrapper. So, so again, you know, there's some exceptions to the world, uh, rule. If you know, you need to, you know, if you needed to move AS AS ASI wirelessly, we would probably specify a 60 or 70 gig uh, wireless Ethernet link. Uh, to move your ASI payload, and we can get data rates uh, um, unbonded, full band with gigabit Ethernet, 1.25 gigabit per second uh, Ethernet data rates for those applications. So video formats and compression, you know, so the best possible quality is uncompressed, highest bit rate. Again, you know, some of you guys, this, this is obvious to you, but, uh, you know, so we have our 60 gig link here, or a sample of our 60 gig link here, that would fit into this category, fully uncompressed, HDSDI comes in, the full payload goes through, we don't do any processing, we don't split that stream apart, it just goes through the link, we have 7 gigs of bandwidth, that's why we're able to do that, HDSDI comes in, comes out, we have uh, simplex, simplex links, bidirectional links, and, and dual channel links, but then if you get into our, our uh, uh, omnidirectional systems or camera mount systems, there's going to be some kind of compression. Usually it's H.264 uh, combined with some kind of encoding on occasion, you know, whether it's uh, 16 QAM or QPSK. So we have to fit 
the, the, the video in a smaller bandwidth. This particular unit operates on the 5 gig band, so we have 20 or 40 megahertz of bandwidth, so we got to get you know, 1.5 gigabit per second video into a 20 or 40 meg pipe. We need some compression. So it is what it is. That, that's the only way to do it. Uh, this has zero latency. This is going to have some latency. Uh, this particular model has about 30 milliseconds or about two frames of latency. Um, so then here's the big factor. So, uh, of course, you know, this equipment's not free. We're, we're not a charitable organization. So there's equipment costs and installation costs. Um, if you're looking at unlicensed bands, you can use those bands for free, hence the term unlicensed. But those bands tend to be crowded, with the exception of 60, which we'll get into. Um, if you want to use a licensed band, there's either usage charges, annual fees, bandwidth charges, cost for time of usage. So there are technologies out there where there's bandwidth charges. There's uh, technologies out there that will make low-quality internet uh, uh, um, uh, pipes, such as uh, uh, Zixi, that, that Z-I-X-I, that will take uh, a relatively low quality link and, and add uh, ARQ, automatic um, uh, resending of data with forward error correction. So there's all kinds of technologies out there. There's a one-time cost to buy it, some that have recurring costs. So again, we can help balance that. And, and, and you know, usually the ones, unfortunately, with the recurring costs work better. So uh, that's why they get away with charging you for that. So again, we can help you weigh those different costs and the, the criticality of your given link, with, which technology is, is the right way to go. Um, then, you know, the FCC in the United States and, and most uh, uh, regulatory agencies around the world have basically from DC you know, virtually DC to the to light, to visible light, or including visible light, they have it regulated um, uh, for the most part. So the use of most of this spectrum uh, requires a license. And uh, there's really only three bands. Uh, this is true for most of the world. Uh, the 2.4 gig Wi-Fi, the 5 gig Wi-Fi, and the 60 gig bands are the only bands that are unlicensed. Uh, the 2.4 and the 5 gig are heavily used, you know, kind of in that order. Extremely used, heavily used. Uh, this is starting to get used, but because it's directional and highly focused, even if it becomes more predominantly used, you could have multiple uh, circuits operating. Uh, you know, its directionality is, is its positive and its negative. It, you know, it, it, it can operate in a noisy environment but then you can't move it around very much. Uh, but I'll get into antenna technology when I, we come back to antenna technology, how we made 60 gigs movable when, it, we, when, we, when we designed our system for the Nat National Hockey League. I'll, I'll get into that. But so not only these are unlicensed bands, but the radiated power is, is licensed. You can't go on the 2.4 gig band and say, I want to, you know, broadcast three watts of power on any of these bands. It's regulated. So uh, uh, us manufacturers, it's our responsibility to stay within those regulations. So, so uh, just because they're unlicensed, it's not you know, open season. Um, so, so license requirements. So the beauty of a license is that uh, the FCC will give you a piece of paper that says you are authorized to use that frequency at a specific location. It might be temporary for a certain time and date or indefinitely at a certain, certain location. Um, you know, so if you're a broadcaster and you cover uh, hockey games at the Staples Center on a regular basis, you might own the right to use a certain band uh, at that venue. Then if somebody wants to use that band when you're not using it, you can barter with local uh, uh, competing uh, van, uh, uh, it's surprising on an engineering stand. Uh, on an, from an engineering standpoint, uh, broadcast engineers collaborate really well, even with competing networks. Because one day their radio will go down, their fiber will break, they'll be knocked off the air, and they might need a feed from that competing guy. Management might be in odds, you know, well, scooping news stories and whatnot. But the engineers always play nice. So if someone owns a license in a given area and they're not using it. It's not uncommon for them to give permission for someone else to use that band 
when it's not being used. Um, but, you know, license is not free. There, there, there is some monetary fee. Some bands are lightly licensed. There's a nominal fee, a couple hundred dollars a year fee. Uh, there might be data usage fees. Um, um, you know, I th a lot of this is, is um, guesstimation. You know, the FCC is going to want to know, well, how much data do you think you're going to push through this link? Um, you know, so you'll have to come up with a, uh, a guesstimate of what bandwidth you're going to use. So, you know, obviously you're going to probably want to downplay how much bandwidth you're going to use. Or they might look at the capability of the link. If they can do push 1.5 gigabits per second, they say, well, you're going to, you might run a lot of bandwidth through there. So, again, these are some of the pluses and minuses, and we, we can step you through that process of getting the FCC paperwork filled out. Uh, uh, we can help you with that. Um, License is nice, uh, uh, you know, again, if, if it's grab and go. If you own a license at a particular venue uh, and something happens at a venue, grab and go, boom, you can go. If it's an unplanned event in the middle of nowhere or at a building unexpected and you don't have a license to operate, you can't bring that radio there. You are not allowed to use, let's just say, your 7-gig radio at an event that you don't, the FCC says you can't, you can't use. You know, you have to, someone else might own the license at that location, so you can't transmit there. Not to say that some people might turn on their transmitter and, you know, usually when people start stepping on each other, that's when they find out that somebody's operating outside of the FCC rules or within the uh, license uh, parameters, but this is all part of the fun. Um, so then portability is, is a big factor, and again, portability is subjective. Um, uh, my dad used to like to joke, you know, if you put his handle on the side of a refrigerator and lift it up, oh, that's portable now. Uh, uh, you know, portability might mean that it is shippable. It will fit into a crate. It will fit into a box uh, or a crate that's not uh, over the limit to go through FedEx or go through UPS. Or it will fit in a crate that a freight forwarder can move. Um, um, portable might mean it, it can go on a camera. That's certainly smaller than something that will fit in a crate. Um, it will fit in a backpack, a bonded cellular. Uh, a lot of these rigs go in, in backpacks. Um, uh, portable might mean it's just low power. Um, you know, I need to operate from a mountaintop. You know, I'm going to drop it out of an airplane or a helicopter, so it's, it still can be relatively heavy, but uh, it's low power so I can operate in the middle of nowhere with, with limited limited power consumption, or I need to run off a battery. So it's kind of one and the same, and, and in a particular type of battery. Uh, you know, Anton Bauer, V-Lock, we support all different types of batteries. Or to some people, portability means it's on a vehicle. The vehicle can move. Um, it's not fixed. So that's portable. And a, an enormous sat, sat truck with, a, with a, a satellite uplink and downlink on the roof of it, because the vehicle can move, they consider that portable or transportable. So again, it's, it's subjective. So, you know, here, back to the antenna. So, so Omni, 365 degrees, low gain, short range, panel or SECTA antennas. It's a little bit more focused, higher gain. Obviously, a 10 degree is going to be higher gain than a 180 degree. So you could have multiples of these covering 365, uh, uh, 360 degrees um, or cover different zones. Um, so this is like kind of a... This is, you know, kind of everywhere. These are highly focused. This is kind of a nice compromise, kind of in the middle. Uh, so the, the, we use these a lot. You saw on a pre previous slide uh, our 5-gig radios, our Vito Link 5G. We, we, we sell these uh, uh, 23 dB panel antennas as an option. Uh, then the parabolic, uh, I'm sorry, the, the horn antennas are, are a higher, higher or highest gain. Their focus they require careful alignment, long range, small profile. Uh, these guys are probably between seven and three, three and a half degrees. Uh, the radios we built for the National Hockey League. Um, well, let, let me back up. Our our our, our uh, uh, three hundred meter radios use uh, uh, three and a half dB uh, uh, horns inside. Um, again, so it, it, the the video the the RF comes out. I call it like the cone, that, that, that Fresnel zone. So as it's actually harder to set up a link that's close because it's like trying to aim through two straws. You're trying to aim two straws at each other. When you get out towards the maximum distance, again, if you go too far beyond the sensitivity of your transmitter and receiver, 
um, obviously it won't work. But if you get towards the end of your, your range, uh, the signal spreads, it gets easier to align. So in the case of the National Hockey League, the hockey goal moves a few degrees. Um, there's rubber pins that hold the hockey goal in place. And the goal can tip up on the rubber pins. As long as it stays on the pins, the play will be active. Well, you've got to figure, if there's guys around the net banging into the goal, making it flip up, a goal might be eminent. So our wireless 60 gig in-net goal transmitter needed to operate with the net moving a few degrees. So our engineers decided to use a 20 degree uh, horn on the transmitter, which was, which was a little unorthodox. Usually you want a tighter beam to go further. Now, we lost gain by going wide because we're spreading the energy. We made up for that by maintaining a 3.5 or 4 degree antenna on the receiver. So the receiver needs critical alignment at the top, at the top of the goal, uh, 150 feet in the air. The, the goal is spreading a, a signal at 100 to 150 feet. It's a 35 degree target. So the goal can move a lot and still maintain. So we work through all these processes. When, when I started working with the NHL, I didn't know that rule about the pins. I hadn't watched hockey since I was a kid. Uh, now anyone who knows me, I'm a little obsessed with hockey. I, I'm, I'm a big fan uh, of the sport. But so, so by asking questions and, and, and understanding that, that little nuance in the game, that rule about the goal tipping, um, think of it in, 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 in a more generic application. Two buildings in Manhattan, you know, they're 80 stories. There's building sway. They can move six inches in high winds. So we might want a little bit of a wider beam, assuming it's a short enough range, or that will reduce our range, to allow the, the antennas to move a little bit. Then you go to parabolic antennas. Similar to horn antennas, they have higher gain, but they're bigger. So some HOAs, some architects, they, they don't want ugly antennas on their buildings. You see all kinds of weird things where they make cell towers look like pine trees or, or uh, uh, high-frequency uh, dish antennas painted to match the facade of the building so they don't, they're not visible. Uh, uh, the benefit of a horn antenna is for a little bit less gain or, or, or less gain in some cases, they're very small profile. Uh, parabolic dishes have higher gain. They tend to be bigger. So again, the, these are some of the trade-offs. Um, I better keep moving here, folks. I, you know, I, I have a bad habit of telling stories, but you know, uh, that's how I have fun. Um, here's an application, uh, sports. So the beauty of sports is it's scheduled. Um, sometimes in the playoffs, uh, when teams are eliminated and whatnot, um, um, they don't know who's going to advance to the next round. But uh, in working with sports leagues, the National Hockey League, NFL, NBA, what they'll do is um, they'll, they'll, they'll calculate probabilities of teams advancing to the next, next level. So if the final is going to be in town, they'll do site surveys in multiple cities. And a lot of times a team doesn't make it to the next round. They, they, they never have a game in that city, but they, they still have to plan for it, the contingency. Otherwise, you know, they might have 24, 48 hours notice to organize RF frequency coordination, bringing trucks in, bringing infrastructure in. So, so they'll, they'll do advanced planning weeks ahead of time, uh, assuming teams uh, uh, you know, will make it through the playoffs. So there is some schedule, predetermined, you know, they know the locations, that, that's engraved in stone. Um, but so it's ideal for wireless. So in this case with the uh, Carolina Panthers, here's a, one of our uh, 60 gig radios. It's on a, a broadcast facility a couple of blocks away from, uh, from the stadium. And uh, they're getting video uh, beamed out from, from the venue. The receiver is mounted somewhere here inside the bowl here. Um, you can see video up on the on the on the scoreboard there. So so this is you know this is this is permanent. It's installed permanently. It's not going to move. Um, in this case, it's an unlicensed. Uh, so don't have to worry about bandwidth. It's a one-time expenditure. There's no recurring fees, no FCC charges. Um, if this was a little further away, they might have had to gone with a 70 gig radio, and then there would be some light licensing involved. Uh, they wouldn't have had a choice. Um, um, uncompressed video uh, at 70 gig, there would, there would be some licensing. Um, so there, there would have been an answer to that solution, you know, an answer to that pain 
if in this case the building was a little further away. We were fine. Uh, we actually over-engineered it a little bit. The building was closer than the, what this link can handle. But you, know, you always want to have a, a safety margin, a, line, a margin of error. Um, our engineers, they'll look at precipitation charts for a given region. And whatever the peak rainfall in that region will, will derate the, the link budget according to that. If there's going to be heavy rain, uh, uh, we, we can account for that. You know, Carolina, you know, they, they probably get some rain down there, some pre precipitation from time to time. So it's good that we over-engineered the, the, the link budget on that uh, for those types of scenarios. So the news gathering, if it's a scheduled event, so it's the Republican convention, the Democratic convention, the Iowa caucuses, it's planned. They know where it's going to be, where it's going to happen, or, or things are, 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 are planned to some extent. So advanced teams, the engineering teams can go out in advance. They can set up. Um, uh, it's a little easier. Breaking news, floods, fires, accidents, earthquakes. Um, they got to grab and go. Uh, uh, you know, so, so traditionally, they'll bring a vehicle, sat truck, microwave truck. Uh, uh, modern, the modern news crew now, you know, because they can't afford a, a sat truck or vehicles, will use bonded cellular uh, because, uh, uh, you know, the, the sat truck's the only other way around that, you know, for a breaking story. Sometimes the sat truck can't get close enough to the actual uh, incident, you know, plane crash in the middle of nowhere. A news guy can get there on his, on his dirt bike, a motorcycle. Uh, uh, we've sold cellular, bonded cellular links to uh, uh, wireless, uh, to... Uh, uh, news guys that uh, freelance news guys that that run around on on motorcycles. So um, cer certainly a lower profile than a sat truck. You know, then those get grab and go. Um, um, you know, uh, years ago or or even still to this day, a a news agency in a given city. You know, I knew that I know they do this in Manhattan where. Uh, um, um, you know, Good Morning America will be. Uh, uh, broadcast from from Central Park or a remote location, so so it's it's planned. So they'll build out some infrastructure. But say there's some breaking news, uh, they want to interview someone unexpectedly. You know, they they bring a sat truck, park it downstairs. If they don't have line of sight to a sat or or a microwave uh, line of sight to to the microwave receiver, they'll record it and beam it later. Um, uh, bonded cellular has has given broadcasters a, a low cost alternative to that. Um, um, you know the the needed infrastructure for microwave. You know if you're going to do microwave around a metro area, you're going to need a central location with multiple antennas on it. You know maybe 360 degrees, and uh, no matter where your your microwave truck is in that tri-state area, if they have line of sight to that tall building. It could be on their uh, transmission antenna uh, tower if that's in the metro area. Um, um, uh, a lot of guys now um, are, are, are going to the Empire State Building. Uh, the the, the uh, World, uh, the Freedom Tower now is, is, is back up. Uh, I'm sure they're going to be putting more transmitters and, 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 set, and microwave uh, receivers on that building again. Um, so so that, that's a way to beam the video back. So bonded cellular, now that there is a national footprint, multiple carriers, they're all supporting 4G LTE. Remember, the LTE uses that COFDM, you know, multipath. It likes multipath. That's why our cell phones, you know, sort of work most of the time. Um, um, but the, the bonded cellular gives you uh, network uh, diversity. So, you know, you could have two modems from AT&T, two modems from Verizon, T-Mobile, Sprint, whatever, and get some diversity there. So if you're in a, if your Sprint is dead, is a dead spot in that location. The other networks will will take over. But you, you know, again, broadcasters have learned to understand the limitations. Um, you know, if if a dozen broadcasters show up at at a twelve alarm fire and expect to broadcast cellular within three feet of each other, they're going to have a problem. Um, there's devices to extend the range, uh, uh, outboard uh, some of the antennas to a remote location so the backpack talks to another device or an extender that might be a few blocks away or within line of sight, away from the crowd. Um, or uh, another way is you, you turn the unit on so it has about 12 seconds of buffering, which is, which is typical. 
And the producers tell me, the news producers, they tell me, you know what they do? Uh, uh, that you know everything's timed in, in a new, newscast, so the, so they'll go. Uh, uh, the anchor will be wrapping up his story. The the producer will see that there's 12 seconds left. He'll cue the talent out in the field, maybe at 11 seconds, to start talking. Say, okay, Bob, start telling us the story going on there. That 12 alarm fire, and then the anchor fan. Okay, boom, and then they they time it. So uh, again, that's the extreme. It's usually not 12 seconds. It's usually three seconds. So they'll just cue the talent out in the field a few seconds early. Um, anchors, CNN, Fox News Channel, the anchors are used to that with satellite comms. There's a couple of second delay. You know, you got soldiers in Afghanistan you're interviewing or talking to. It's going to be a couple of seconds delay. So, so the, the talent, the producer, the control room, uh, they understand the limitation. They have workarounds for this. Again, you know, backpack is a lot cheaper than a multi-million dollar sat truck. So, so you know, again, we, we can help you make these decisions, get through uh, uh, the different types of technology. So uh, I know this is, might seem like an abrupt uh, point to stop, but uh, we're kind of coming up on the 45-minute mark, well, it, we, despite our a uh, little bit of a delayed start. So what we're going to get into in... Um, in January, uh, uh, it's going to be on a Thursday. I, I think the first Thursday is actually New Year's Day, so we're probably going to do the do it. Uh, it's either going to be the seventh or the eighth. Got to look at the calendar. But so the first uh, full week in 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 January, we're going to do part two of this series. We'll send you a um, an email reminder, uh, and we're going to dive into the get deeper into the technologies. We're going to talk about microwave, the, the Wi-Fi bands, the pluses and minuses, uh, bonded cellular, 60 and 70 gig for uncompressed video and for wireless Ethernet. We're going to show you some comparisons of the two, and then we're going to discuss, you know, how do we make the intelligent choice? How do we make the best solution for our, for our uh, 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 project at hand? And uh, again, here, here's my favorite topic. Here, here's our goal cam. So this is the net that tips, you know, 20 degrees back and forth during hockey play. It sits on the top of the goal, and it beams to this receiver. So if you asked me five years ago that I was going to design a wireless system that would go in a hockey goal, I, I, I probably wouldn't have believed you. But, uh, you know, we listen to a potential client. We listen to their pain, listen to their issues, listen to how the, the workflow of the game, you know, we want to learn more about your business. and, and Hopefully we, you know, not everyone's in the market for an in-net goal camera, but I'm sure you have some pain, some struggle you have in your business, and, you know, we would like to, to help you with that. So I'm sure a lot of you guys know who we are. They, you guys probably know me personally. But for those of you who don't know, uh, Vitovation, we're provi provi pr primarily a video and data communications manufacturer. Uh, our, our tagline here, you know, moving video forward. We help clients move video from point A to point B, uh, whether that's wireless, fiber optics, encoding, H.264, uh, video networking, IPTV, streaming, webcasting uh, are some of the, the areas of our, our expertise. We help broadcasters, TV networks, sports leagues. Uh, we work with enterprise IT departments who are uh, know nothing about video, but know everything about their network, so we kind of help to merge the video worlds and the IT worlds together. Uh, again, we, we, feel our, we feel ourselves as problem, we feel that we're a bunch of problem solvers here. That's what, that's what we, uh, we, we, we live for. So, you know, we help those clients that are frustrated with dropouts in their wireless video. Again, you know, uh, uh, the, the best wireless video si system if it's not used properly, um, you know, you need to understand the limitations. You know, we can set up multi-antenna arrays, multiple antennas around a sporting bowl, uh, antennas in the locker room where a cameraman can seamlessly go from, you know, the coin toss on the 50-yard line, uh, either end of the field, into either locker room, out into concourse if we have a distributed antenna system. So if a system is planned properly and the cameraman goes where he's supposed to go, we can make a system that's virtually 100% reliable. If you're on a limited budget, you know, again, there might be some dropouts here or there, but we, you know, we'll give you the best possible system for your budget. 
Um, you know, again, if, if you're confused with the basic fundamentals, should I go wireless, should I go fiber, should I go coax? Um, if you can go wired, optically, coaxial, that's always the most reliable choice. Uh, uh, you know, we're not going to force someone to use wireless if uh, the camera is going to be relatively fixed. Uh, fiber optics would be the most uh, logical solution, coax. Uh, even over uh, a LAN encoding uh, uh, would be would be the best choice. So so again, you know, we we we'll help you go wireless when that's the right uh, uh, um, uh, solution to the problem. Case of the NHL, they experimented with running power cables and video cables under the ice. Didn't work well. So wireless was the only choice. Uh, we help our clients who are struggling with the balance between encoder latency in my budget. You know, unfortunately, a low latency encoder costs more. So we can help weigh those different choices. You know, we have uh, entry level encoders. We have some very high end encoders. We have encoders in the middle. We can help you make that decision. And then, uh, you know, common theme is, you know, just streaming video in general, whether it's on the internet or over your network. If you're irritated or frustrated with interruptions in your video streaming, we can help you with that. So. Uh, if you or anyone you know has some of these issues, uh, we'd love to hear from you or, or hear from any referrals that you might send our way. Uh, we're here to help. Uh, we're, we're a bunch of engineers re ready to help, ready to roll up our sleeves and help solve some of, the, some of your issues. Uh, here's a list of uh, uh, clients I've worked with and our team has worked with over the years. I won't read them to you. I won't, I won't torture you with that. Um, uh, Troy will have this uh, uh, webinar, uh, if not up by tomorrow, Monday at the latest, uh, the recording uh, uh, of this webinar um, uh, online. Um, uh, be sure to uh, uh, register for the uh, part two. You guys will, will get a reminder of that uh, come the new year. Um, does anyone have any questions? Let me see if uh, question queue here. I think I can see. If not, I'll let you guys get back to work. Um, anybody? Oh, I see somebody raising their hand. Tony, let's see. What are you? What are you asking, Tony? I see you raising your hand. Can you can you ask your question in the in the chat, Tony? Um, let me see here. Is there? How come I don't see that? I don't see. Do you see the questions, Troy? Oh, okay. I'm on the chat. I'm sorry. Sorry, guys. Uh, that's weird. I don't see the question. What? What's the question, Troy? Okay, so Troy, Troy just uh, uh, Troy, Troy's behind this uh, Vitovation cloud. You can see here, it's got the Vitovation logo on it. I don't aim it that way because I, I, you know, I, I hate webcasts that have bright lights in the background. But you can see this cloud. Uh, we did a, a Disney diversity event, and they and they gave us this nice cloud. So I have Disney to thank. Uh, a woman-owned diversity function we went to. Um, so, so uh, someone asked about what's the next generation STL, STL Studio to transmit or link. So, actually, just a few days ago, um, uh, I had the uh, pleasure of being asked to speak at NAB again under the Broadcast Engineering Conference track, and um, um, we're presenting uh, papers on. Um, Transp transporting 10 gigabits per second and more over wireless. And the way that is done is, I mentioned in this paper, uh, 16 QAM, uh, 64 QAM, um, heavier encoding. Um, the 60 gigahertz band is nice in that you have a 7 gigahertz wide channel to work with. And it will, it will support very nicely uh, higher uh, encoding schemes. So w again, we can go from 2 bits, 4 bits, 8 bits, 16 bits, higher order encoding to get more bits through the same pipe. Um, right now, our systems are, are, are 
relatively simple. Um, that's why there's no latency. Again, if we add this encoding to put more through that pipe, it's going to add a little bit of latency, not a lot. Um, um, it still might be on the order of 10, 10 milliseconds or less or 5 milliseconds. Uh, again, I don't, I don't want to, engineers are probably going to shoot me for, for saying that, but uh, uh, I probably can get some hard numbers on it. It's still going to be pretty low latency. Right now, our 60 gig is essentially zero. You know, it's just, it's just basically the speed of light uh, on the link distance. Um, so, so yes, I will be presenting in, in April uh, a paper on 10 and 12 gigabit per second throughput uh, for wireless in general, but more specifically 60 and 70 gigahertz. Uh, I haven't written that paper yet, but that, that's just basically the, the, the outline. So, so we will have higher bit rate uh, capability coming out. And um, um, in my next presentation, I'm going to talk about the, the 5 gigahertz band, 802.11ac, uh, has some provisions for um, 160 megabit channels. Um, there's some techniques to get. Uh, 600 meg, 1.3 uh, gigabits per second through Wi-Fi. Again, some of this is theoretical. The provisions are there in the specs. Um, uh, manufacturers haven't actually made it happen yet. The chipsets are not quite there yet. But uh, we'll talk about that after the holidays. We'll dive into that. Um, I'm not going to go too in-depth on 802.11. That could be a whole nother uh, uh, 802.11 AC. That could be a whole nother paper. Um, but the the um, there are some some limitations to watch out for in the uh, 802.11 AC spec. But uh, as far as this uh, the NAB paper, I'm going to present in, in a few months. Uh, we're going to concentrate on 60 and 70 gigs. So and, and and for an STL link, that's a highly directional. You know, you're beaming to your transmitter, beaming to a mountaintop. So 60 or 70 gigs would be perfect for that. Uh, you probably wouldn't want to do a 5 gig radio for that anyway, to, to reach those distances. So um, um, that's funny. I don't know why I, I'm not seeing the questions. Uh, were there any other questions, Troy? All right, folks. Um, you can see my email address here at the bottom, J-I-M-J, J-I-M-J, at vidovation.com. Feel free to shoot me an email. Um, for those of you who are connected to me on LinkedIn, you know I'm really active on LinkedIn. You probably, uh, Troy helps me a lot. I, I can't take all the credit, but, you know, we, we work on the content together or the distribution of the content that we create. Um, Troy Harrington is our sales and marketing. Uh, he's my right-hand man back there. Um, so so uh, feel free to connect to me on LinkedIn. Um, um, you know, uh, go to our website, download white papers. We have white papers on fiber optics. Um, when we're done with the uh, series on uh, wireless, uh, in mid-January, we're going to start a series on fiber optics. Um, um, there is some fiber optic white papers on our website, but it's probably stops at about four years ago as far as the technology. So uh, if you've downloaded any of our fiber optic white papers, I'm going to have significant updates in the area of 4K, where we are right now, and, and some future-looking statements in that. So uh, the fiber optics series, if you feel you've already heard that from us, um, uh, there'll definitely be a lot of added material in that. It's probably going to be a multi-part series. I, I'm guessing it's probably going to be at least four or five parts, if not more. There's a lot of content to have there on fiber. So stay tuned to all that. and. Happy holidays, everyone. Uh, may you have a uh, happy new year. Uh, may you have a prosperous 2015. And uh, anytime you you have a pain or an issue uh, or, or a question in the area of, of video communications, please remember to give Vidovation a shout. We appreciate you calling. Thank you very much, folks. I'll let, I'll let you get back to work. Thank you. Bye-bye.